Termites, it's night two. Who's excited about that? What are we drinking tonight? My favorite, well, it's a tie. My favorite Irish whiskey probably is Jameson. But if I'm feeling a little more kickish, red breast. Now there's three kinds. There's 12, 18, and I think 21. 12 is the cheapest and I like it the best. I have had the 18 in Ireland too, and the 21. Lewis wanted that. And I, I'm just a cheap date, turns out. This is what I re recommend. And not because it's the cheapest, I just like it the best. Maybe somebody from Ireland can explain to me what the difference is, because I really, I don't know. But we also had, had a lot of the 12 before I drank the 18, so maybe I sold it down the river for the wrong reasons. Hmm? All right, we're back. This is Loretta talking about her memories after she went to the premiere of Coal Miner's Daughter. And most of her memories are in Butcher Holler, which is in Kentucky, and I'm going to practice that accent. I'm going to watch Coal Miner's Daughter. I know it's a lot more like that. People from Kentucky feel free to critique me, tell me what I'm doing wrong. It was when my grandma Webb died. Even though I was only 11 months old, this is a funeral. She says she remembers at 11 months old. Maybe. I could still see my daddy, Ted Webb, carrying me alongside the men taking his mama's body from the house and carrying it to a willow tree near her front gate. Daddy carried me in his arms while them pallbearers stepped down the stones to cross a creek. This president didn't say creek. They buried grandma in the hills of Kentucky where time and weather have made her a headstone, a fading marker. Daddy was wearing a white shirt and he was crying. I'd never seen him cry in a white shirt. I no, wait, I'd never seen him in a white shirt and I'd never seen my daddy cry. Both of them scared me to death. Maybe that's what made the memory stand out for so long. Probably. I guess it's important that my first memory is one of loss. Well, not necessarily. Could have been a pony. Could have been a beagle. It's important for me to tell about it in this book. Like I said earlier, a lot of what happened to me in the past 27 years. Oh my God, she's only 27 when she's writing this. Oh my God. These people live such hard lives. Has been about losing people. Butcher Holler, Kentucky is a coal mining and moonshining community about 12 miles from Paintsville in eastern Kentucky, about 18 miles from the West Virginia border. Can you picture it? I can picture exactly where that is. I can picture it. It's pretty up there. That's why there's more hills, because I'm thinking, like, you get around Nashville, ain't that many? it's fine, but not like this. Ain't no hollers around here. You can ask anybody in Paintsville how to find Butcher Holler. They'll direct you to a gravel road, and it ain't really gravel. It's called Red Dog, and it's made from slack that wasn't quite coal. I've never heard of that. It was burnt for years and turned red. You'll only drive so far until you have to get out and walk along a path into Butcher Holler. Okay, me and Vic didn't have to do that. If we would have driven the rental car to the part where it said, now you got to get out and go on foot, well, no. During the Second World War, they got... They thought about making Red Dog Road into the holler, but people got to thinking and said they didn't want one. Won't. That's Kentucky. Won't. They didn't want one. They figured Hitler might fly over Kentucky. <laughs> oh, my God. That Hitler might fly over Kentucky and see that red line leading into the mountains and think it was a target instead of a little old holler. Who the fuck came up with that? Hitler, Hitler had a lot on his mind, and I don't think it was Kentucky. Of course, some of the trick is sometimes finding your way out of Butcher Holler, as some unlucky revenues on the track of moonshiners found out over the year. That's just another side of mountain life, the world doing I came from, that you can't get out of the neighborhood. <laughs> Well, the moonshiner shouldn't have been back there. You're supposed to be driving that moonshine to Nashville, Knoxville, some Asheville, some in some ville and sell it. If mountain people was anything when I was growing up, they was resourceful. They wasted nothing and they was loyal. No stranger ever entered Butcher Holler without folks yelling from shack to shack, stranger coming up the holler, stranger coming up the holler. They didn't know a lot about the world outside the holler because they didn't need that world. They could make their own way. That's right, you got squirrels, you're good. 
There's some people in that holler today, I'm satisfied, who don't know the name of the president and don't care. I'm going to say there's probably a little meth in the holler. Just saying. There's probably a little meth that's made a way down. Back then, the worst you had was moonshine. Now you got to deal with the meth people. People have asked why there's an old, no road to my old home place instead of just a dirt path. Why would there have been a hard rock road back in them days? Most folks traveled on horse or mule or even in a homemade sled pulled by a mule. You know why you use mules? I know this from the Ozark Rocky Mountains. Because mules do better than horses on rocks. Don't say you didn't learn anything from this lady. There's a guy on the road to our farm. He's called Donald the Donkey Man. Donald sells donkeys. Because back in the day in the Ozarks, you needed a donkey, a.k.a. mule. Almost the same thing. Maybe the same thing. That I don't know. To pull your wagon. You ain't getting up them rocky Ozark hills. I'll tell you that. Most folks traveled on horse, a mule, or homemade mule. I didn't even have a car until I was 13, and that was Dew's Jeep. There was no development in rural eastern Kentucky then or now. <laughs> Nobody ever went to Butcher Holler except a few folks who lived there or their kin folks when they came to visit. If you walk a mule on a hard road, you got to put steel shoes on the mule. We couldn't even afford shoes ourselves. We each got a pair of broken shoes a year, and each pair was two sizes too large so we could grow into them before we found, got another pair the following year. And mine were just like the boys. I guess at some point you'd hope your feet stopped growing so at, some, at least one year your shoes would fit. That'd be fun. My daddy thought everybody in Butcher Holler was born to stay there, and most of the time that was true. I was five years old and under the table when I remember Mommy saying, Ted Webb, you're going to get me and these kids out of this holler. Nobody here is ever going to get ahead in this life or get no education. I was in Butcher Holler not all that long for the first time in my life when I looked around and thought, how in the world did I ever get out of here? The answer's easy, of course. Do little Lynn took me out. So I guess you got to give him credit for that. But let's not forget, he's older than her. I don't know how much, but a, a, a few years. And she was really pretty, so he, it's not like he was doing uh, the world a favor, too. Most modern thing that ever happened back there was when Daddy bought a battery-operated Philco radio and we listened to newscasters Lowell Thomas and Gabriel Heater. On night, Saturday nights, we listened to the Grand Old Opry in Nashville. Daddy wouldn't let us play nothing because he didn't want to run down the batteries. He could probably buy a new one for a dime. I don't remember. I remember hearing Ernest Tubbs sing Rainbow at Midnight. And it's, been, and it's been so long, darling, on the Opry. Every time he sung, I cried. Again, I was probably two years, only two, I was probably two, two years away from getting married. If nobody told me in the 1940s that in 1967 I'd have a hit duet sweet thing with Ernest, I wouldn't believe them. But then, if anybody told me in the 1940s that I'd ever get out of Butcher Holler, I wouldn't believe them either. Well, and thank God Hitler didn't come. Whew. That would have been crazy, right? We had a one-room schoolhouse that my great-grandpa, Bidweb, built, and my grandpa, my own daddy, and us attended. The school had a row for every grade, and that made for a mixed bunch. Some kid who hadn't gone, some kids, some kid who hadn't gone beyond the fourth grade might be almost six feet tall sitting behind a little girl who's only eight or nine years old. And nobody wanted to go to school in Butcher Holler during my time there, and the country stopped the welfare payments to families whose kids didn't attend class. Well, that was probably a good idea. Who did that? You know what? Um, I don't know how many children you have and where they're at, but unless they're in this schoolhouse, you ain't getting no money, no cash. They gotta get some education. Or maybe we shouldn't have. Maybe we should have just left them uneducated in a holler. So lots of parents made their kids go to school just so they could get more money for groceries and such. I mean, I've seen 15-year-old boys enroll in school for the first time so their mommies and daddies could get some money. Them boys wore bib overalls and broken shoes and those heavy shoes that could come up to the top of your ankles. Those old farm boys were tough and mean, and they'd kick the fire out of teachers. Our little country school had trouble keeping teachers because the big old boys ran them off. That's one reason learning came hard in the hills. That should have been a song, right? Learning came hard in the hills. H-H-H. Should have been in the holler. Learning came hard in the holler. That'd be a great country album. 
They might not have wanted to go to school, but people in Butcher Holler could come up with our ways to make a living, even if it wasn't much of a living. They didn't throw nothing away. They could find a practical use for anything. It, remember when everyone was worried about that Y2K thing that might come on New Year's Day 2000? I do. Because every comedy club in America thought, we can't book shows, the whole world's going to blow up. It's ridiculous. Some writers... In big papers like the Los Angeles Times and such said there might not be any electricity or running water or gasoline or telephones. It didn't worry me a bit, thanks to my upbringing. <laughs> I love to watch the A&E channel, Arts and Entertainment, and there was a show on August 11, 1999 that said the whole station was predicted by some experts to go dark at midnight on New Year's Eve, 1999, and if there wasn't any electricity, a lot of folks would ha wouldn't have heat and wouldn't be able to cook. And if there was no running water, how would, how would folks drink? How would they flush toilets? If there wasn't no gasoline, how would folks get to work? How would folks pay bills since the mail trucks run on gasoline too? I'm the last person that want to see Y2K prediction come true, but I lived without electricity, indoor plumbing, or central heat every day of my life until I was a grown woman. I don't know if air conditioning even been invented, but I know we'd never heard of it. We'd never heard of a furnace or central heat either. By golly, but by golly, we could survive. Take hunting, for example. My daddy loved possum and trapped them, but mommy was the hunter. I've done some hillbilly ass things, but I've never eaten possum, and nor do I ever want to because it looks like a pink rat. I've tasted squirrel. I'll admit it. I know how to clean a squirrel. It's really crazy when you do it. Not that I plan on doing it again, but I am capable if somebody wants to go on the amazing race with me into a holler. I can do that, but that's all. Is that show still on? I don't even know. Possum is greasy meat. So mama would cook it as long as she could to cook the grease away without letting the meat turn dry. It's a rodent. Then she'd put it back. Then she'd put sweet potatoes and sage on top of the possum and put it all in a big bread pan into the wood stove. I remember eating that meal until I left home at 13. <sighs> you know what? I don't think it's that good either. Because stuff that's on the border will make it on a menu. Like alligator, it's not that good, but it makes it on menus. You know, um, squirrel I've seen on a few mem menus out in the deep, deep south. But I've never seen possum on a menu, ever. After I met Dew, I learned to fish and hunt just like Dew and my mommy. In them days, Dew would kill them. I'd skin them, cut them, and put them in the freezer locker. I learned to hunt and fish just like my brothers when I was still lifting in Butcher Holler. I was a good shot, too, and still am. The reason folks in the hills are such good shot, it can mean the difference between not eat, eating and not eating. I don't know how it is, even though we couldn't have always afforded food, we always had shells or bullets, because they're cheap, probably. Shortly after we was married, me and Do and me moved to Washington State where he could find work. Do had worked in Kentucky coal mines, but he didn't want to do that for the rest of his life. I don't blame him. You're going to get black lung, you're going to die early. But when we got to Washington State, Dew often had to leave to find another job or run moonshine or Lord knows what. I remember he'd go off for days at a time when we got to Washington, leaving me and my babies alone. And I think there was three or four. Well, one of those times, we got down to where we was eating mostly dandelion greens. Oh, my God. Like a lot of poor folks did and still do. Hmm. <laughs> I never heard of that. One day... When I was at, about at the end of my rope, I saw a pheasant cross the pond, probably 100 yards away. <laughs> Speaking of pheasants, um, I don't know if you've ever seen one in the wild, but one time, Lewis and I uh, were in Ireland at a golf course, and it was super early in the morning, and uh, he walked outside to smoke a cigarette, and I started hearing him going, Kath, get laid. Get out here. And I go, what? He goes, there's a giant chicken walking up the fairway. I'm like, what? Could be in Ireland. Could be a, a rogue chicken. And I said, where, Lou? And he pointed. If you've never seen a pheasant, first of all, they're like this low to the ground. And they kind of waddle. It does not resemble a chicken. Not even, no. A ch no. I said, Louis, that's a pheasant. You need to get, you need to leave New York City more often. 
One day when I was about to, I saw a pheasant cross the pond probably 100 yards away. That's far. I grabbed Dew's old 22 rifle. That gun was broke because one day Dew got so mad at me, picked it up and broke the stock off. But I guess I could still shoot it. Sh but I guess I could still shoot us a meal with it. I ran outside, took, a, took aim, and got that bird in the head with one shot. It could never have happened twice. I waded out in that palm and the water plumb up to my neck to get that pheasant I'd shot. I can remember sitting one foot slowly into the other to make sure the water didn't get too deep. When I was certain it was take to, safe to take a step, I did. I cleaned that bird and it was the first meat me and the kids had in three weeks. I was getting a little ahead of myself, though, but I was just trying to make a point about how those of us lived without any conveniences learned to survive. A person who did just whatever he had to do in order to earn a living or just stay alive. I bet nobody in Butcher Holler, Kentucky, was worried about Y2K. Probably not. In the mountains, we worried about things like staying alive. Folks seemed to always find a way to scuffle a living, even if they had to make moonshine or steal. Have you guys ever had moonshine? If you go to Gatlinburg, um, there's a, a distillery there and you can get a flight of moonshine tasters and it's only five dollars. And they're, just when you think it can't get any better, they have new flavors. Vanilla, blueberry, uh, hunch punch, one of my favorites, margarita. There's a coffee one. I'm not a big coffee person, but apparently if you are, that's a good one. Just if you're ever rolling through Tennessee, stop in Gatlinburg and go to that moon. I don't even know what it's. Oh, it's called Old Smoky. And you can find that in liquor stores like regular liquor stores they have old smoky moonshine comes in a jar careful though because it's delicious but it will fuck you up i would recommend two shots no more followed by a beer one shot beer 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 shot beer 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 no more shots ron white had so many shots one night i left him um because i said i'm going home and he's like well i'm not done drinking and i said well i'm done drinking and i went home he later texted me a picture of himself in the back seat of some of his fans' car that were taking him to White Castle. Now, the thing is, Ron wouldn't see any kind of problem with that. I don't have a problem that there is fans. That's nice of them. But you shouldn't get in a car with strangers. Let's just go back to that rule we learned when we were little. And they offered to take him to White Castle. And he got his White Castle. He got the briefcase. You know, you can do that at White Castle. So take, take home a sack is steak and shake. But he had a briefcase. And uh, he went, they took him back to his hotel. Everything was safe and nice. And he ate him alone. That's what happens when you have too much moonshine. You get in the car with strangers. But like most of Ron White's life, it worked out just fine. All right, we're gonna finish up where we're at here. That's a little moonshine story, let me see. Um, oh, she got the hemp papa. In the mountains, we worried about th things like staying alive. Oh, let's go, I already did that. Uh, uh, oh, one of the most clever fellers I ever met was an old boy who came to Butcher Holler when I was 13, wanting to take folks' pictures for 25 cents. But meeting him ended up causing my feelings to get hurt about as bad as they'd ever been. And that was a scar I carried with me for a long time. I still carry it. Here's the story of my pitcher and Grandpa Ramey. Well, we're going to stop right there. I'm going to mark that. So we got a little story. That's where we're going to start. That's a nice picture, picture of it right there. I'm surprised it didn't say get to pi trying to make people's picture, pictures. Because a lot of Southerners say, a lot of Southerners say I got my picture made. My friend Scott Kennedy, he's also passed away. He was from Texas. He's like, I'm going to get my picture made with Drew Carey. It was like 100 years ago at the Improv. I'm like, you're going to do what? Get my picture made. Like, anyway. All right, termites. Football's on. If you're a football fan, that's good, right? That's something to do. Thursday night. Sunday. Sunday night. Monday night. Really irritating people like my sister, whose husbands play fantasy football, because that's a lot of time. They're checking their phones. I think they're cutting back on the Thursday game, so. No, maybe not. All right. You know what you guys are? You're fall termites. That's what you are. T-shirt. I'm wearing mine. See? I saved one. Then my parents said, oh, can we have one? No, because you don't watch it. You call it me talking in a chair reading shit. I don't have that shirt, do I, Dad?
I don't have a shirt that says Kathleen Madigan talking in a chair reading shit. Maybe I should, but I don't. I only have these, and we ran out, and then I had to order more. Some of you termites have gotten extremely chubby during COVID quarantine, and that's okay. Don't feel bad about it. There's plenty of time we don't really see other people. I only colored my hair because I was bored. Nobody's going to see it. Who cares? Maybe at Thanksgiving at the farm. I don't want my mother going, why, do, why, do, why doesn't your hair look right? No, she can't say that. And then I'll say, um, why don't your teeth look right? And then she'll go and click them out. All right, termites. Get your nice fall blankets. It's getting chilly. It's nice. Leaves are changing in places where they have leaves. And uh, the fire feels delightful. Isn't that the song? That's all I got for you, termites. You're worthy, termites. You're strong, termites. Some of you are chubby. That's okay. Some of you are losing weight, I heard. I don't know how that's happening, but good for you. Ready? Pull your blanket up. Close your eyes. Night-night termites.